We have to shorten it, even though this is the most interesting part of the city, but well, we'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, well, welcome to the cybersecurity session. Everything that you heard before at the CDIG uh, probably won't work if the security is not good. So we'll have some very negative impacts. I'm not going to even give you the ideas of what we spoke about during the IoT um, panel on what could go wrong with the IoTs, for instance. You can, you can imagine. Um, now, the first rule of this session uh, is that you should get your phones on. Not off, on. Well, not the, the, the sound, but the phones into your hands and the laptops into your hands because we'll have a lot of um, checks and, and the polls, as you can see. And the first one, while I'm introducing the whole concept, you can see it over there. Uh, all you have to do is go to the menti.com and enter the code that you see over there. And I hope you can see it from the back of the rows. And uh, respond to the first question that we have uh, for the start of the, of the workshop. And that is, what is the main cybersecurity related challenge in Southeastern Europe? So whatever you think um, is going wrong in Southeastern Europe when it comes to cybersecurity, um, just type it. Let, and let's see what's going to come out as, uh, as the top one. For the time being, it was intelligent agencies, but let's see. We'll get back to that. Okay. The second thing, and I think that probably should have been the first one, is my name is Vladimir Radunovic from the Foundation. I'll, I'll moderate this panel. Uh, you might have seen on the website that the idea of this panel is a, that it's not a panel, that it's actually a discussion. So the people here sitting are actually not here. They're not panelists. They are part of the audience, but they, just for the sake of microphones, they're sitting here. But I will present them because they'll help us reflect on some of the discussions today. So starting from the left is Grigana Petrova, whom you've already seen yesterday at some of the panels, from RIPE NCC, let's say technical community to some extent. Then we have Francisca Klopfer, who is from the uh, Geneva Center for Democratic Control of Armed Forces, DICAF. Yes, I managed to, to say it once. Uh, she's in a way in the shoes of the security sector, but she'll probably explain it more afterwards. Don't hate her for that. Um, and then we, then we have... Uh, Peter Tasseski, who is, who is what was the best way to present you, cybersecurity.mk, um, a researcher, a geek, um, also working in the bank, so he's also a, a kind of a private sector guy, uh, who's going to help us. And there are a couple of other people over there and all of you to, to try to, to help us discuss today. What is the concept of the session? We said last year at the CDIC, we went into the roles of different stakeholders. This year we said, let's go into strategic level. What should be the strategic steps of the countries in Southeastern Europe when it comes to cybersecurity? And what is the level of regional cooperation? Where are we when it comes to cybersecurity? But this is boring. So we are not going to discuss it from that angle. We'll start it from a dif different angle. We start it from the, firstly from the, from the um, challenges. And then we'll start from, uh, or move into a specific case of, uh, of ransomware, which we had also in the region a couple of weeks ago, try to dissect it to see what happened, what went wrong, who is guilty. Um, that's the wrong question, but we'll ask it. Uh, and see what sh we should do as all the stakeholders, what should be done in order to prevent something like that. And then we we'll raise it to the, to the strategic level and see what are the strategic pillars that probably the region should have. Okay, now moving to the first part, let's see. Uh, folks, I think you can give a quick comment. Uh, we have the identity theft as the the key uh, security challenge, credit card frauds, but then I see governments, which is quite interesting. Uh, anyone from the government that wants to comment? Well, they're the problem. Hmm? They, they generate They're the problem, okay, one of the challenges. Anyone from the government that wants to comment? Fotion, do you want to comment? Uh, the government uh, make the regulations and the government standards or um, country regulation but uh, is uh, it's any time is in attack so is the most critical infrastructure in the part of the government that's that's a good way to see it uh, it's the government is a target as well i don't think that Probably the people that voted like that wanted to say that. But, uh, but uh, there is also a, a matter of communication. Uh, Francisca, um, you work a lot with governments and with security sector. Are, there, are they a problem? I mean, are, there, are the governments the challenge in cybersecurity? Let me just come and you talk about. And of course, I think what people probably think about is, you know, uh, scandals, recent scandals about misuse of surveillance uh, technologies uh, for political reasons. So, 
so, so, so I think, yes, the government, if they misuse uh, technology, then they are become the problem. Um, okay, we'll get back to governments uh, on a particular case. Uh, but then we also have, and that's, this is what I like, ignorance. That's probably one of the, uh, one of the key messages they will take afterwards and the uh, awareness raising. And I like this one on Facebook. This is interesting. Uh, but it's, uh, since it is a cloud, it means a couple of people actually say Facebook. That's what's quite, quite interesting. Okay, let's move on to the first part, which is, and we can keep changing that, but we'll move to, to a, a second question very soon. And I do want to focus on a particular case of, of uh, WannaCry um, ransomware virus, which we had um, even in the region here. Why is that? Because we want to go through what actually happened and why did it happen. After all, who, whose fault is that, to some extent? So I'll turn to Peja to briefly explain us um, what, what the hell happened over there and why did it happen with the, with the ransomware. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah, so the one that we had actually two weeks ago is still running. One a crypto, so it's like well-known exploit, of course. But fortunately, what's happening is uh, it has been publicly available for ages, but no one has exploited it very well. So no one has been using it. And what is happening in, is getting exploitment on one of the operating system. be 
honest, it was it was my colleague from from the business development, and he 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 he, he had a red face because it, it was a blame because he he is IT literate and he know about that. But yes, that's that's the that, that's the, the the nature that he clicked where he 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 uh, didn't have to click. Um, the interesting case of uh, of people that actually, and we all make mistakes, but the problem is that <clears throat> then we, we are uh, ashamed that we actually did something like that. And instead of um, saying that we did something stupid, we keep it quiet. Because we feel that someone else is going to blame us for what we did. And on contrary, the practice should be that we should say, okay, this happens, let me at least say what happened, and the IT guys would know what happens, and then I would probably learn from that, and my colleagues would learn from that as well. So that, that could be one of the practices to change. Now, back to the, to the sort of a voting. I know this is a very wrong question, but I'm purposely putting it on. Whose primary fault is it for the incidents like um, WannaCry? Governments, internet industry, like Microsoft and the others, the vendors, internet service providers, telecoms, and so on, uh, CEO level, that means the decision maker level, policy makers, and so on, that do not invest enough in cybersecurity, IT support departments uh, or users. And I leave it to you to comment for a while. And then I'll, I'll, I'll pass the mic to, to Milan to put himself, himself in the shoes of the government, which is very hard for him. Um, why do the governments use the exploits and uh, why does the NSA need it? And uh, I mean, can we trust them if they do these things? Sure, now it's my, uh, uh, it's my turn to be the devil's advocate. Um, well, they, they, uh, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people crying at the NSA about and the governments, even Microsoft was uh, criticizing the governments for using these tools and creating these kind of tools. But they do because that's kind of what the intelligence agencies do. And uh, it's not, uh, we should, we should, we shouldn't forget that they're not actually the enemy of the citizens, or they shouldn't be the enemy of the citizens. They shouldn't be. Um, they are. They do have a role to play in societies. They do develop these kind of tools uh, and use them about uh, against uh, and should use them against criminals, against terrorists, against the bad people. Uh, the problem. I mean, it would be in an ideal world we wouldn't have. A, a, uh, security forces, we wouldn't have criminals, we wouldn't have weapons, but unfortunately we live in a world where we do have them. But they should be careful in how they store them. Same like they should be careful in how they store bombs and how they use bombs. They should also be careful in how they store and use these kind of weapons. And there should be policies, there should be accountability measures in place, which we are lacking, and we're even lacking the discussion of it. Uh, and the discussion is not there because we ignore the fact, fact that, that, yes, they do spy, that's their job, that, that's what they do. They do develop this kind of tools, they will develop them in the future. But let's think how to make sure that they are deployed and, and stored properly, if that's possible. This, this goes very well with, uh, with the great discussions we had at the youth school in the first day. So, I'll pass the floor to Mike, but I would also like someone of the folks, and especially ladies that were very active in the first day, uh, those from the security group, but possibly also from the other, to sum up what did we discuss or what was, what was sort of uh, arguments when it comes to um, uh, the role of the security sector and, uh, and the government in, in security in general, cybersecurity. So think about it, um, any one of you from the group on, on security. But well, Michael. Well, I actually had a <coughs> direct report point. I had a direct point that I wanted to make. So <coughs> it's not about the youth school, forgive me. So the first thing is that um, I think that almost everybody in the room here will agree or could agree anyway to the fact that <coughs> everybody in one point or another is all of these stakeholders are responsible at some level. Users for not, for not updating their software or not backing up their data. Um, uh, you know, companies for not supporting software security, but even then that's contentious because XP has been, uh, you know, not unsupported for, for years. Is it the hospitals for not upgrading? But the fact is, this question's a bit, a bit um, misleading in a certain way because 
in my perspective, WannaCry was very different from the others. I think that the, what the NSA did was absolutely criminal. I mean, the way that patients in, in hospitals might have died just because the NSA was using it for their offensive capabilities, even, I'm oh, sorry, I'm speaking very quickly, even though, even though um, there is the, the convention in the United States that says that uh, if, you know, they find zero days, if they find backdoors, they need to tell Microsoft or whatever other internet company about it. So I think in particular, WannaCry is a bit different from the others, at least based on my experience and based on what I want to know. I was the one that voted, I was one of the four people that voted for governments, but this is not meant to put the governments, especially here in the region, on, on, on alert, because I think that this is a very specific case and, and of gross negligence. Um, NSA is just one of the governments, which is actually using the exploits. Uh, some researchers, and I'll pass the floor afterwards to Andriana, who did a bit of a research on that, uh, is that many, many other governments are actually investing in, in offensive cyber weapons. Uh, so this is becoming a big problem or a big issue, if, if we wish. Uh, we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, yeah, I, I really want to hear, because I think the discussions were great, um, conflicting sort of privacy versus security, even though it's not either or. But there were some great arguments about how to look into the role of the of the security sector, and that's why I wanted to hear. Hello? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the City Guild School yesterday had a very interesting debate. Uh, we had privacy team and security team, and the security team uh, highlighted the importance of cooperation, and we mentioned the when a cry situation, the case, and uh, maybe uh, in a situation where there is a strong cooperation between the government and companies, uh, maybe NSA would warn Microsoft about the vulnerabilities instead of trying to use them for their own uh, purposes and interests. Thanks. Um, now I'm looking back at the, at the results that we have, <clears throat> and I see that the internet industry grow up a little bit, uh, so it's, it's uh, equal with the government. Uh, which brings us back, Michael, to your, to your comment, to what extent the government is definitely, um, it, it's, it's fault for misusing the exploit, but then again, the exploit is in the industry, in the software, uh, which raises the question of the liability of the industry. Uh, I don't know, yeah, uh, Mike, you can pass the mic over there. Mike, you can pass the mic. Uh, <laughs> uh, about the, the fault of the industry. Of course, they create the software, but if you, there have been a lot of people saying, okay, we have to hold the, all the software developers accountable so that they're not allowed to, to sell software which, isn't, which, which has bugs. But this, this is completely insane because that, that would pretty much kill the whole software industry the next day because you can have software without bugs. I mean, it, I suppose everybody knows that the more complex a system is, the more easily is to uh, for, for mistakes to slip by any kind of uh, QA uh, team. When you have something as complex as a, an operating system or a network composed of tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of computers, each with various operating systems, it's absolutely impossible for it not to have weaknesses and bugs and breaches which can be exploited. So if you're going to hold industry accountable, um, then we have to pretty much ban industry, which I don't think is really conducive to, <laughs> to any kind of conversation. <laughs> A bit of a question or comment for you or for, for everyone on that. So maybe you can keep uh, the microphone. Uh, uh, is that uh, 
we are not saying uh, in sense of or let's see what what could be the so sort of the liability of the industry it doesn't have to be of course the banning but if we expect to get a washing machine uh, working properly and we can complain if it doesn't if we expect to have the Samsung phone not to explode for instance and we can hold the industry liable could we hold the industry liable for the products which are not uh, secure in sense of they could either cover the loss which can be great they could invest more in bringing the ethical hackers to find the uh, the vulnerabilities they could even buy from the black market if that's the only way to do so but the in and also the patching system doesn't seem to really work the way it used to be working well any comments i mean i think that getting industry involved to find discovered bugs that's well that's standard operating procedure anyway and that makes sense but the pro i don't think microsoft or google or whatever other software developer when they are told, okay, we found this problem, let's fix it because this is something really serious. They will say, no, just go away, we don't care about this. I really doubt someone will say that. But for example, if NSA would be, act well, the example of NSA, if they were, would be actually about, you know, protecting the citizenry as they officially, you know, say they are, when they find this, uh, uh, um, a breach like that, an exploit like that, they should go to Microsoft and say, okay, we found this, let's fix it. Okay, maybe we can help you, maybe you do it on your own, but you should at least know about it. But no, they stockpiled it and weaponized it, and, and it's not just the NSA doing that, it's all the, well, most many of the intelligence service i mean i was the one writing intelligence agencies because they're doing this kind of stuff uh, and this is this is this is a problem i mean yeah okay thanks and that's uh, that, that gives us also brings us to the discussion on the internet of things that we also have before and uh, the, the WannaCry is not the only example of the, the problems that we had. We had the Mirai botnet, which was actually hijacking the Internet of Things tools, which are not protected. Because the industry that's producing the Internet of Things is not really investing in security by default, by design, if we wish. So that's also sort of a problem. But I, I, I think the message that we could get from that is sort of a, a communication that should exist between the, uh, to the extent possible, between the, the companies, um, vendors and uh, governments and so on, rather than misusing it. But uh, before passing the floor to, to us or Kirgana, you can, you can take it. Yes, I would like to uh, comment on uh, what you just said about uh, um, software liability. Um, so I do understand uh, your line of logic uh, when we have tens of thousands of line of codes uh, mistakes are bound to happen and I do understand that we don't want to burden the internet industry uh, to the point that we stifle innovation I mean uh, this is something that we all as society benefit from at the same time keep in mind that um, 85 percent of all uh, attacks are a result of vulnerabilities that have been known for 10 years and so at some point of time you need to draw the line as an industry and say hey you know what um, sure there is a lot of complexity but uh, there needs to be also at least some um, some level of responsibility there is a lot of level of complexity in heart surgery as well uh, it is not only the software industry that uh, that is this unbelievably complex with no parallel in the universe uh, and there are a lot of um, um, th there, there's responsibility in other industries and there also, for example, insurance uh, in case something goes wrong. So they, um, I, I think that uh, it is a bit dangerous to uh, lift all liability from um, companies that are producing software because what that results in, that results up, um, in um, competition to push products as fast as possible without any um, oversight of, hey, is my product safe? There is just a yeah, uh, pushing to the markets uh, without any regard of what the effects on the consumer are going to be like. So it is important that we as a society take a look at uh, what, what we want to happen and if we want this situation without any accountability to persist in the future. I'm curious what, uh, what you think about that. But make sure that you're... You, you So oh, uh, my, my retort to that is that, uh, yes, there, there have been a, a 
actually most of the attacks are done against known exploits. But uh, what usually happens is that the software developers fix them, but it is the users who don't apply the patches, don't do the updates for various reasons. Some of them are out of ignorance, as it was mentioned. Others are out of various other reasons. Uh, for example, nowadays, uh, with Windows 10, they force you to do the updates, and they slip slip in all kinds of telemetry updates, all kinds of borderline spyware, anti-features, and so on. Uh, so, for example, a Windows 7, Windows 8, where you could still refuse to do updates, people just check out of that saying, okay, I'll just stop doing updates because I don't want Microsoft Leave me telemetry updates. Well, here's a counter argument. There are a lot of uh, products that they are no longer supported. So sometimes you, you, you have a software, sometimes you have hardware that runs a specific software that is no longer supported. So are you supposed to just chuck it out and get a new one? Especially in our region, spending that kind of money is not possible. You still have machines that are 15 years old and you would like to still use them, but the manufacturer is no longer supporting them. And so you're left on your own. That's, I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, after all, the, uh, someone who produced a, soft, a piece of software at some point can be, you know, a slave to all, to everybody who ever started using that forever. At some point, it, 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 it wouldn't make business sense to keep supporting decade, decade old uh, pieces of software. Yeah, it, it really, I don't know how to put it any, any more diplomatic, but yeah, it sucks. But Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like the discussion because it, it really goes somewhere between the industry, the responsibility of the industry, the technical sector, the users, and then of course the governments which misuse it. And, and, and just, just a small thing I, I would like to add. So we're now talking about, after all, Windows XP because wanna cry. But in the banking industry, they still use software written in Fortran and COBOL in what, 60s, 70s? They're, they're ancient stuff. I mean, uh, Pedrag knows more about this kind of stuff, but there's a lot of really ancient software being used uh, in banking. And uh, I, I think actually, what, what actually in banking, no, no longer a supply due to the fact that regulatory has very strict rules and laws nowadays. However, on the other industry, which is uh, air, like pl uh, planes, flight control, and all this, oh my gosh. And uh, I think what, what we, when we get Even back older to... older than anyone else here in the room, you have <laughs> operating systems. Like, there is like only like two people able to function and to maintain the software that you have in your control. Everything else has in your life yeah. of old age. Yes. So if something happens to them, it's a crisis. Unfortunately. And, and that's basically what, what Gergana also said, especially for the region, because, uh, for instance, in, in the hospitals or other services, in public service, we have systems which are linked to XP. If you want to get a new software that costs them amount of money, and then you also have to get the uh, new, new Windows versions, and we don't have funds for that, and usually people say, don't touch it, it works. Yeah until something like this happens, right? But however, when we speak about medicine, telemedicine particularly, I can assure you that uh, the industry nowadays are starting to use the latest embedded systems and technologies due, and of course languages due to the fact that they are starting to be aware and they are starting to freak out that actually they exploit all, it is exploitable and vulnerable to the attack. And especially we have seen to IoT now that we are aware of it. So this is the thing. Something has to happen, so then you start to be aware. Or you have to fall on the stairs, and then you be careful. If you don't fall on the stairs, you won't be careful. So it's a very straightforward approach. And if something happens, then you're starting to be, ooh, let's see what's happening here. And then you're starting investigating, and then you figure it out that actually, it's not a question, I do agree the topic that comes, and I said before, whose fault it is? I will say all. 
and, and I think you're, you're totally right. We can summarize what you said when it needs to happen, unfortunately, and in many countries, including in Netherlands and Estonia, it needed to happen so that we realize. But then at least, as they say, don't waste the crisis. When we have the crisis, we at least shouldn't waste it. Now, I, I like that we, we have a huge number of comments on the user's side as well. Uh, and we had some changes over there, more on a CEO level, which is also interesting that there is a lack of, there is a gap between those that should be strategically thinking about investments in cybersecurity, either in companies or in governments, and those that should be actually implementing it. So that's quite an important uh, issue. Before passing on to the next part, uh, I just wanted to get back to Andreana about the, uh, some of the research that, that, that she did on, on how many governments, how much, to what extent the governments are actually investing in offensive and, and defensive cyber capabilities. I guess there are no governments, at least no records in, in this region, but, uh, but generally, globally, it's interesting. Hello, everyone. I'm Andriana from, from Diplo Foundation. I was a part of a researcher's team that, as Lada said, mapped out the defensive and offensive capabilities of governments around the world. Now, offensive is very interesting because, shockingly enough, governments do not really want to tell the whole world how much they are going to invest. So we have data for Russia, China, Australia, US, Canada, and I believe England and France. It's a bit hard to access this over my phone, I'm sorry. but what what I found particularly interesting is that Russia stated in 2016, uh, Federal Security Service said that they are creating a deterrent system that is in response to similar pla plans announced by the US. So you can see that there is not a lot of trust uh, among governments and it's definitely the wrong approach. Thanks. Um, any comments on this one before we move on, on to the next one? Uh, so the next one is now turning into, into what should we do? So the next one is, and I invite you to, um, this is kind of an open question. What are the measures, what are lessons learned? What are the measures that we, any one of, that, of us, governments, um, industry, users, um, IT sector should do when it comes to cybersecurity to prevent uh, these things to happen uh, and to maybe react to them? So anything that you think should come up you back up your data, that sounds good. Education, education, education. Go on. And I'll pass it to Peja because Peja, you mentioned already some bits of that. Uh, but, uh, but maybe give some, some other thoughts out of your head, just brainstorm what else should we do? So first of all, awareness, awareness, awareness. Then education, education, education. But then comes something else. When you become aware, when you become educated, what do you do? You start implementing security measures in your devices. However, nowadays we have thousand or hundred standards, frameworks, laws, or company policies. What has to be implemented? <laughs> and I always say, nevertheless, what do you do? Be aware that your system cannot be 100% secure, never. Always that 1% is actually one of the most crucial and most important. For this reason, always I always say, use whatever you want, but be aware of using the best practices. Best practices are any processes, backup, encrypt your data, if you have, of course, sensitive data, use anti-RS, anti-malware, and so on and so on devices. And of course, be aware what you're clicking on. Um, any other comments that you want to share without writing? Now, I see there is a lot of education there. What I'm missing, uh, but that's, that's absolutely fine. What I'm missing is a more, well, education is a systematic one, uh, but some of those are like backup and so on are kind of procedural ones. Is there anything more systematic that we see that the government should do? Mike, you want? That, uh, that the government should do, that the private sector should do, that this is probably more on the user side. Uh, not on the user side. Well, I guess you could consider it on the user side. So for me, one thing that I was thinking a lot about as I was reading about um, uh, the ransomware attack WannaCry, I kept thinking, well, a lot of the system or a lot of some of the institutions that were hit, for instance, hospitals, um, a lot of them say that, you know, I, 
from what I read, they say, well, we can't afford to come to upgrade our systems. Like they, maybe they have uh, problems with, the, with funding. What I would suggest is potentially more multi-stakeholder solutions to help subsidize, you know, whether it be private sector organizations or nonprofit organizations, whatever you want to call them. Let's say organizations that are there for the public good to help them um, uh, update their security software. Part of the problem that they have is, for instance, some of the old, their, their vendors don't update their software. With the vendors meaning that they have software for specific health needs or for specific health functions, let's say, that are not being updated or that are, you know, it's really um, cumbersome or very hard for them to write new code for this or you know, to work with the, the organization. So the point is, can there be more, I'm sorry if I'm not being very clear, what I'm trying to say is, can there be more kind of um, maybe government facilitated, um, government facilitated, uh, you know, uh, gov sorry, I keep getting, interrupting myself. Um, government facilitated interaction that can help, um, you know, these public good, these institutions that are doing public good to secure themselves and do it in a cost effective way. In the end, we do need to think about costs because they are really expensive. Um, I have uh, Vladimir, and then I have Valentina, and then uh, back again. So um, you worked a lot on a st strategies in general, and uh, as, as Mike said, uh, if you go into sort of a standards, sort of sort of a, um, things that the, that the industry should do, it brings more economic costs on them, right? It, it uh, on one hand, it, it brings a burden to them, but on the other, the communication between the stakeholders is also important. What are your takes? Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, very, very important is uh, relation between government structures and and the private sector, and, and why? Uh, for uh, companies, for uh, industry, for private sectors, is uh, some uh, uh, procedures for, for on uh, of information securities, and for the government is very important uh, and the strategies, uh, and all countries has. A strategy of cyber security and action plans and all this. And uh, uh, according to these uh, strategies, it's uh, uh, very important also uh, legislations yes, because it's a device uh, functions for uh, government and the private sectors also. Uh, Valentina? In the meantime, I'm, t I'm looking at, the, at what we have over there and some of the systematic besides uh, ABC123, which is a very systematic response, lay down and cry also. But there is a, <laughs> there is a make, make CSERT, the computer emergency response teams, basically on a national level, uh, more um, yeah, operational, which is a systematic response to that. Uh, one more, most important, just plug off the computer. Yeah, there was one actually. Switch off well, switch the router. Saying, yeah, yeah. switch off the no, router. Switch off the router is different. Ah, that's different. Right? Okay, okay. It's different. Okay, Valentina. And then we'll have uh, in the back. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, we always talk about a specific uh, kind of industry that use specific kind of software that are proprietary that you cannot look inside. And you have to believe what they say, that they are good enough. So why we don't switch, at least when we talk about uh, public, uh, to free and open software so that they can be inspected? Why they don't pay and they don't invest? Because we talk about big corporations, we talk about VM, Oracle, if they just give the taxes that they do not pay in the country where they work to do what they are supposed to do, produce good, solid products, we might have less troubles. We will have always trouble. So let's give money back and invest the money so that the shareholders don't need to have billions to be a ranking first and fourth and have more money that country, GPD or whatever, this would be one. Second, paying fines, because as a user, I cannot feel always the responsibility to be ingenious and be a genius, and I don't want to be constantly disconnected, because this is called a siege. I can stay without electricity if it's necessary. 
I can stay without the water, I can go also to take water nearby, but I don't think that this is my human rights. And innovation should be bound to human rights. So I think there are different models of industry. Why we always forgive this industry the abusive richness that they have? Thank you. Thank you for, for also linking this to, to human rights, because I think it's important. And we'll see many discussions about cybersecurity that human rights come hand in hand with that. But we can get back to that later on. Uh, Francisca, and then we'll go back and then there. Yeah, actually, I want to pick up from there and also from some of the other solutions uh, that were suggested about, you know, what different stakeholders can do. And, and I think that's all, all, all super interesting and useful. I want to just bring in um, a study that we did. I think Vlad already mentioned it earlier. Diplo Foundation um, organized it. Uh, um, I contributed to it, and, and, and so did Pet, uh, on comparing really um, the state of um, cybersecurity policy in the region, in the Western Balkan region. And also then the second part was, uh, you know, ways of um, better cooperation between the countries. But on the first part about comparing, you know, the development of cybersecurity, cybersecurity policies, what is, was interesting there, what we found is that basic laws on cybercrime, they were all in place. Uh, when it then came to laws on um, information security or, or, or generally more cybersecurity, countries were um, a lot less quick to enforce that. Also, setting up certs. Uh, some countries were, were quick, others are really dragging their feet. So, and, and not to talk in bigger, you know, bigger policies, really preventive policies, like big um, um, education policies or setting up uh, even discussions about uh, pu uh, public private partnerships. Uh, that was, you know, really missing. There are little things here and there, but not really um, um, a strategic. Uh, efforts um, and talking about strategies, strategies as well. Some countries had set them up, but often they were just, you know, a piece of paper not being used. And that, for for me, is key in in, in, this, in the policy process. That uh, it, all these approaches seem very reactive. So you make a you make a law quickly on cybercrime because everybody talks about it, and maybe it's even required by you know international organisations. But when it came, comes to you know, having a strategy and really discussing the strategy, also using that discussion on the strategy as an opportunity to really talk with all, you know, stakeholders about what is really needed, what does cybersecurity even mean, and what, you know, are the, the, the challenges, uh, the needs, but also the, you know, the, uh, of different stakeholders, what can, but what can they also contribute, what is their role. These discussions were not had. And I think that's a big, uh, you know, it, it's general. Uh, generally, I think uh, you can say that for many countries, but this is what I know now because this is what we looked at in the region. So I think when we talk about these different solutions and we talk about who's responsible, and that it's, it's nice to have this discussion here, but I think these discussions have to be done in a more, uh, you know, serious and, 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 and a coherent way uh, at national level. Basically, you basically raised the uh, uh, importance of, and I see that th those things pop up now also as well, which is collaboration among stakeholders, communication, exchange, of knowledge and information. Uh, because as you said, the strategic planning, especially the implementation part, cannot go without the ownership of all the stakeholders, uh, multi-stakeholder approach in sh policy shaping, and then public-private partnership in implementation might be one of the messages. Uh, we go back, we'll go uh, back to you, uh, Gergan, later. Um, we go back there and there, and then we... Hello, uh, my name is Ardita and I'm working for OSE. Uh, we have recently developed policies with regard to cybersecurity and we are working in the region for that. In, uh, with relation to host country, uh, I see some of our stakeholders here and some of all However, I wanted to point out this is a risk management. We cannot be disconnected, we just have to make sure that the vulnerability plus resources uh, and we are calculating the damage. Is it acceptable or not? If the damage is acceptable to the party, then go ahead, get it. If the damage is not acceptable to the party, then invest more. However, what we have noticed within national and international structures is that the lack of awareness until recent attack happens when the recent attack happens, oh, we have to see, we have to invest. And that's the life. 
uh, the form of the crime has changed, so the form of the risk has changed, so the form of the evaluation should be changed as well. And I think the more we are aware of it, the better we can estimate the vulnerabilities of systems, of uh, vulnerability of states, of institutions, and so forth. I'm not here to talk about government or private sector. I'm here to talk about the new form of economy, new form of crime, new form of uh, transnational connections. Uh, over there? Ah, you have it. Okay, good. What uh, something Mike said uh, made me realize something. He was talking about you know having all this old software which is out of service, uh, and that's essentially abandonware. If you're familiar with the the, the term abandonware, essentially software which has been abandoned by its creator and its uh, commercial software, proprietary, closed source, so you can modify. You just use it as it is and work around its imperfections. Uh, and I think that one option of not having this problem is stimulating the use of open source, source software. Because with open source, even if, let's say, it's abandoned by the community, if something arises, you can still go and patch uh, any newly developed, uh, d discovered issues. But, yeah, I mean, in some situations it might be easy to, to stimulate the use of open source, in others not so easy, but I think this, this is something that should be considered and could be a, a positive step forward. Somehow I get the idea that you were the one to post keep calm Linux and encrypt. But, <laughs> but, but that's the message. No, it makes sense, absolutely. Open source is definitely one of the, the um, possible ways ahead. Uh, Gagana, you wanted to add something and then I'll move to the kind of a next level. Yes, uh, so we are talking about lessons learned from uh, these attacks. And I have the feeling that we're missing one crucial piece of information, and that is who is behind those attacks. So what we know so far is actually uh, from the WannaCry uh, ransomware attack, they have been, there hasn't been so much money generated from it. I think about 50,000 euros. Um, okay, that is a lot for one person, but actually uh, when we're talking about uh, the grant, uh, 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 the global scale of the attack, that is not so much. So that raises some interesting questions. Are the people uh, who are behind the attack not really professionals? Or are there even scarier doing this for training? So is there an even bigger attack coming up? Uh, or um, are they just trying to send us a message? So what exactly is their goal? It's still unclear to us. Um, and so maybe the one positive thing that is coming from the WannaCry, also the Mirai botnet um, DDoS attack is uh, raising the awareness uh, of how vulnerable we are and how vulnerable even our critical infrastructure is um, uh, from those attacks. Um, and so, um, yeah, Vlad already mentioned, let's not waste a crisis. Um, but maybe a lesson that we could also take from this um, cyber attacks are here to stay. So let's, uh, maybe it's also important, for example, um, Sometimes after a, a crisis like this, governments are really in a hurry to be seen as doing something, so they push some fast circulation without really thinking it through. I think it's really important for us to, to continuously keep in mind, so cyber warfare is now part of our lives and we should uh, not forget about it. We should constantly engage uh, with governments, with all stakeholders about uh, about this and keep the conversation going and help them if they want to, uh, for example, come up with some regulation to protect us, um, be, uh, be there to help them um, to develop it during calmer times rather than only responding when disaster strikes. I think, uh, I really hope that this kind of stays with us so we can continue the dialogue and uh, hopefully come up with more informed way, way forward rather than just reacting to the disaster. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm trying to put it now on a, on a little bit upper level. So before uh, we had sort of the lessons learned and me measured that we, we could take to uh, respond to such a risk. 
And now we are trying to see what are the key priorities when it comes to uh, strategic planning uh, about cybersecurity. So some of the countries in the region do have cybersecurity cyber strategies, most not. Uh, those, some of those that have um, copied something that Anissa suggested, which is good, uh, usually it doesn't go into implementation, but we can discuss that later. So um, I took out that the, the letters are small, but when you go to your mobile phones or, or um, gadgets, you'll see it uh, clearly. Uh, what we're trying to do is to, to rate the importance of different strategic pillars for the Southeastern Europe. Now, all of them are important, but what do you think? What is more important than, than what? Uh, that's on one scale. On, on the other one is the, uh, the reality. So basically, uh, what is the, the reality of how each of these issues is uh, dealt with in Southeastern Europe? And I'll read them through, and you can go to your devices and try to mark it. So first one is combating cybercrime. Then we have critical information um, uh, infrastructure protection. Then we, we have cert functionality. We have awareness and cybersecurity culture, education and research, public-private partnership, human rights um, and privacy, conflict prevention and confidence building measures, um, international cooperation, also in sense of what Gergana mentioned, cyber defense and uh, child protection online. So you can try to rate each one of those on both scales, on scale of importance as you see it for the region and for our countries, uh, and then on a scale of um, reality, basically, or where are we, how to what extent the countries are actually dealing with that in, in our region. Uh, and coming back to that, we have a couple of responses. Let me see, what we have four is awareness and cybersecurity culture seems to be the most important, but also that the governments are actually working, or the systems, that the countries are actually having that high on a, on a strategic level. Uh, okay, go on with that. Uh, in the meantime, um, Vladimir, I'll get back to you once again, because you worked on the strategic papers for Georgia. Some of the experiences and main, main pillars that, that were incorporated in the strategic planning in, in Georgia, uh, having in mind all the political uh, environment that you are in and so on, um, some experiences. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk about our Georgian experience. As, uh, we have uh, now secondary uh, cybersecurity cyber security strategy and action plan also. Uh, and uh, on the second uh, strategy, I worked on this. As, uh, and uh, and uh, after, after August War, 2008, and uh, we de de developed this uh, sector uh, with the supporting of Estonian colleagues. And, uh, and now, uh, what is important in this strategy is some international relations is very important. Awareness and education is also very important. And, uh, and uh, very important also some uh, technical issues, and as, as, uh, like some uh, cyber lab and cyber laboratory is very important also. And um, the relation between, between the government, all, all, all stakeholders, and the government, private sector, uh, also the technical society is very important also. Um, uh, what about this? It's, uh, it is our uh, small experience, the Georgian experience. And, Thanks. Um, anyone who wants to share experiences about the strategic planning and the process in, in your countries? Um, how many countries do have strategy on cybersecurity from the region? Romania, Albania, uh, Croatia, Ukraine. Does anyone want to... Uh, Slovenia, right? Does anyone want to share the experience? Trauka. If, if you know the details of what's inside. Not much, huh? About the process, or... Maybe only say I, I don't know the details, but uh, recently I learned that about 40% of this strategy is concerning education. Do you have the mic over there? No, okay. Okay. So, Romini. So, I just have one comment, one word comment about the Romanian. Uh, cybersecurity strategy process closed. 
But I, I think actually that's the that's the case in most of the countries. That uh, one of the complaints that that it's done by the government without much of the um, consultations, and we've seen in a previous step to what extent uh, the measures we need to take uh, to to prevent something like an attack is actually very a shared responsibility. And and then on the other hand, we have that's why this reality check is now. By the way, for those that are voting still, this SAT is the wrong one. It should be the reality. So that you know. Change. Uh, do you want to share anything about the Ukraine experience? If you if you know, if you're aware about the process, it's like um, the aim of the document is kind of uh, very uh, very restricted because it is aimed at the uh, countering the Russian aggression at the moment. But uh, since it is a strategic document, then uh, it makes more sense to make it uh, in a broader wording so that uh, in case uh, some. Uh, um, some new uh, some new challenges arise, then you also can uh, apply the, uh, this document for that, and uh, also also it uh, prescribes uh, like uh, more specific regulation to be uh, adopted on the national level. But it also says about uh, that uh, uh, anything which is uh, counter to national interest and national security, and once this like that it is contra to national interests, then uh, uh, this uh, should be a kind of Prosecuted, but it's still like uh, at the like strategy level. Who knows? Be more specified later. Uh, thanks. Uh, can we can we get the the idea from Slovenia? I don't know to what extent you're aware, at least with the pro. Um, so hi. Sorry, I just have to swallow my gum. Mm. <laughs> okay. He, he jumped on me with the microphone. Like, anyway, uh, yes, uh, in Slovenia we're doing, I guess you could say, several things. So uh, on, on one level we have a very good um, CERT system, so uh, the, the Center for, for um, Strategic Responses related to threats, uh, threats around um, online and cybersecurity. On the other hand, we've just established a new agency that deals with, with online threats and um, cyber crime and, and cyber warfare. And at the same time, we're, I guess you could say that's the, the similar, uh, in, that's the similar as in Croatia, we're, we're emphasizing awareness and, and, um, and learning about it. But the problem being, uh, I heard today we've been discussing a lot about, you know, raising awareness and, and uh, doing, uh, doing informative and educational work, and that's fine. But on the other hand, um, um, the, the idea is, recent idea is to move from raising awareness to establishing security culture. So it's not just, you know, that people are aware of not clicking links in, in weird emails, but that, that the companies and governments and other entities are, let's say, generally aware of the, you know, how to how to behave and how to react on on things that are happening so it's not just you know you should know about this but you should know how to how to react and how to how to prevent these things thanks and and a quick question for you uh, about the process to what extent was it open to uh, was it uh, was it open to yes it, i mean the, the strategy was was uh, was written by by the government then it was put uh, into public discussion uh, Particip I'm in the public discussion, there were a lot of, um, um, as I said before, entities from the government, from the public sector, from, from the industry that participated and gave comments. The government took those comments, uh, integrated it, let's say, more or less in the, in the, final, in the final strategy, and I mean, yeah. And then it was, you know, uh, put into law. And okay, now we're we're waiting for the government and the you know the newly established agency to start uh, to start uh, using the you know strategy. Yeah, there was, there was a, a sort of an open 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 um, consultation process. Yes. Now I'm taking before passing the floor to, to Milan and then further uh, trying to see what we have here. We have uh, the most important where all of them are closed and that's clear that, that you judge that all of those issues are very important. Uh, but what we see is that education and research is the top priority, if I can see well. And then the second one is protection of the critical information structure, infrastructure, and then uh, awareness in cybersecurity culture, and then uh, human rights and privacy. That's interesting. Um, and then when it comes to the reality check, we can see that actually awareness uh, is doing quite well in, in the region and international cooperation to some extent. 
That's strange, but we'll see that. Uh, uh, and then a little bit be behind that is education, research, and, and uh, human rights and privacy, and so on and so forth. Okay, we'll move on. Uh, Milan? Uh, thanks. I just, I just wanted to make a general comment about... Uh, okay, I'm, I live in Serbia, uh, so I can comment about processes in Serbia, but I would believe that it also can be applied to all of the region when it comes to, in general, strategies and, and how we make them and what we what we do with them. Uh, generally, in, in, in Serbia, usually the, the, the strategy drafting process is uh, done uh, in order to tick the box, uh, usually because of your integration or, or some other meaning or just because it sounds good that we should do it. Uh, so often the inclusive process is uh, very much liking. Um, so also, uh, the strategy should, should tell us where we want to get and how we're going to get there. And usually that bit is very much missing. Uh, we get strategies which usually describe the state of affairs as, as it is, maybe give general terms where we want to be, but then how we get there and who's controlling, are we implementing the strategy, whose responsibility is it, did we, did we allocate rest resources because we can say, you know, our strategic goal is to build a spaceship, but, you know, do we know how, do we have with, with, with what to build it? And so those, those things are often lacking and they are lacking for the cybersecurity strategy development process in Serbia now, the, at least the way I see it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, I think it should be noted that uh, having strategy uh, is much better than not having it at all. Because still, however it was built, it will have some good sentences, it will have some, it may have a positive impact and it may give umbrella to those who are willing to implement some portions of the strategy. So the strategy as a, as a whole probably won't be implemented, uh, but some portions of it may be implemented and those who would be doing that would have the umbrella of strategy, which is very important. So, yeah, that's... I think the emphasis on the implementation is, is uh, important because we do see in our region that we actually have papers which are not usable. And that always brings me back to uh, an interesting story some of you might know the story of a lawyer, Valtazar Bogisic, who used to be uh, building up the civil law in Montenegro during the Napoleonian time. And he was basically um, asked to do a civil law for, for Montenegro. So what he did, uh, he went through, through the people and collected the customs of people, what they do, how they feel, uh, in order to involve them in building up the, the whole law, uh, in a way to, to get them the, the, the sort of the ownership of the whole law. And then it was absolutely accepted in, and, and implemented because it reflected the needs and people were involved. It is an old example, but I think especially in the case of cybersecurity where we actually have a lot of stakeholders which do have stakes and you can't defend on your own, this, this has more sense than ever to build, to bring all together and, and make it a process, which brings back to what Bogdan said. It's usually closed, unfortunately, but what's the experience from Albania? Okay. Um... In Albania case, uh, uh, cybersecurity strategy, uh, the most important elements are education, of course, the critical infrastructure, and the safe internet that include uh, children protection and user protection. And we are working also to uh, security law, uh, which is included also cybercrime, and uh, are dealing with to, to uh, we have decided a methodology in how to prevent or to manage uh, critical infrastructure uh, attacks. So that means, yeah, well, more or less the topics are, are similar across the region, similar to the European strategy, so it's not a big deal. The, the big deal is the implementation, actually. And I'll, I'll focus at the end just quickly on the international cooperation, because it's interesting that it's important. Uh, but on the other hand, while, while we do see a, a bit of international cooperation or growing one when it comes to the cooperation with, between the countries discussing the norms and confidence building measures, there is the UN uh, government group of expert process uh, of discussing the norms of behaviors of states in cyberspace. There is the OSCE process on discussing the confidence building measures uh, among states to avoid the conflicts. At the same time, we know that, okay, the Balkans at least, but beyond that, uh, uh, the Southeastern Europe is just sort of a barrel of gunpowder, and we always need a, a trigger for some, some big conflicts. Uh, cyber could be, and we, we saw that in, in around the world, could be a, a, 
um, kind of a trigger of misunderstanding if there is no dialogue among states. Now, um, to what extent the, the region, Southeastern Europe, is actually involved in dialogue? Is there any sort of a cooperation among the countries? We discussed previously that the CERTs are cooperating, uh, at least through ENISA and some established uh, systems. But to what extent the governments are actually discussing cyber on their agenda when they meet? That's a big question. I'll pass the floor to Francisca again to, to maybe show us some light of what, what, we, what we found in the research or, we, or what we didn't find in research. And then if there is any other comment about or the, the example from the regional cooperation. Francisca. Um, let me start by what we didn't find in the research. <laughs> a lot we didn't find. Uh, we were looking a lot at uh, you know, what cooperation exists between the countries in the Western Balkans on, on all different kinds of aspects of cybersecurity because we thought you know, uh, there are so many areas where the countries could really uh, or have to cooperate if it's just you know, uh, on a very basic level of you know um addressing common threats but also you know exchanging expertise because we're saying you know we don't have a lot of uh, resources so it's good to exchange expertise or even you know tools uh, um uh, but also you know to just have common policy discussions in order to uh, maybe uh, come up with a joint standard or and being together be more uh, presented in international fora where um, uh, international standards and cyber security are discussed. So we didn't really find much at all, which I think again goes back to the fact that uh, countries uh, in general don't seem to have you know, very clear and open policies about you know, what their plans really are in cyber security and therefore also what um, uh, regional or international cooperation plays uh, as part of this policy. So we looked uh, we, you know, at um, uh, more what, what already existing regional cooperation bodies do in this field and uh, of course they don't do much at all. Uh, um, and I mean these are bodies like the RCC, the regional cooperation uh, body for, for the region. Uh, they are, their main mandate is not cyber security but, uh, so you, uh, but still they, they haven't really taken it up yet. They, they, there, you know, in the West Balkans uh, or Southeast Europe, there's so many these, of these joint bodies that exist. Uh, a lot of them actually maybe don't work uh, that much anyway anymore, uh, and, and few of them have really dealt with cybersecurity. And if so, they maybe had a seminar here, another one there. But none of them has been given or has taken up a mandate to really do, uh, you know, either you know joint trainings, for example, or to sit together to work on joint policies. Um, so the we, you know, we found that there's really quite a lot still missing and uh, that we should maybe think more about how can these bodies be used more. But to, before we even go there, I think before we even look at bodies or what, we have to really ask ourselves again, or the countries have to ask themselves, so why do we want to cooperate and why is it uh, important? And then what do we want to cooperate on? And I think that's important just to remember that whatever we talk about, we shouldn't like set up another uh, one of these many cooperation bodies which are not nice and people talk about it and everybody's happy that uh, there apparently is dialogue. But more that you think about, okay, well, how can cooperation help cybersecurity in the different countries for the people of the different countries? Where does it make sense? And who needs to cooperate? Because it's not just governments. I mean, for example, um, law enforcement cooperation makes a lot of sense. It happens already a little bit, uh, can, can be increased governments, but also, you know, other stakeholders, how can they cooperate more and how can, you know, different mechanisms be set up to facilitate their cooperation. But again, the other, the, my main point was that whatever is done, it should be done in a, first of all, logical and, um, but also in a transparent way. So it is really clear what is done, why, between whom, who's talking with whom, to which end, um, and that also obviously this is all done uh, with the ultimate aim of, of uh, you know, um, securing the rights of the of the people, uh, and ensuring their security, but within a human rights framework. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the findings were not really uh, encouraging. Uh, we'll share. I'll, I'll tweet uh, later on the link to the full report if any, anyone is interested in details. It is quite interesting. There are some also some good uh, suggestions on how cooperation in the region can be boosted. Is there any, any thoughts on the regional cooperation or any, any good example that we can share on regional cooperation when it comes to cybersecurity? At least one. I, would, I was hoping to see one. I know it's hard to say. 
two. Okay, that's that's comforting. Yeah, well, I, I could share one one example, uh, which is actually coming from the from the ministries of interior, from police. Um, so, DKF, the organization that Francisca and me are working for, is also uh, hosting the Secretariat of Police Cooperation Convention in Southeast Europe, which actually facilitates uh, dialogue and communication cooperation between the ministries of interior from Vienna all the way to Moldova. Uh, EU, non-EU, all of the regional countries. Uh, and through that they have uh, different working uh, models. One of them is expert working groups on telecommunications and within that group uh, they are actually discussing the information security of the, of the systems of ministries of interior and police. And in Serbia and I'm, I'm sure in other countries as well, they, this is not just about protecting the, the police service or police operations or you know, their surveillance capabilities. Uh, it's not that at all. It's actually protecting citizens' data, which is used and needed for the e-government services and uh, documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there, there is this kind of started organically through through their meetings and information security is one of the topics, and this hopefully can then be raised to, to higher levels. Thanks, at least one good. Okay, we have another one in here. Well, it's good, we have something to share. Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I uh, want to give the example of Albania and Kosovo. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, in uh, action, They have had common hackathons and the ICTs in the, uh, encouraging students to participate and learn more about information security, but uh, and Albanians CERT and uh, Kosovo once have very interesting uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. I managed to lose all the three microphones. I don't know where they are. Uh, okay, here and there. Oh, we have it. Okay. Then. Ah, the streaming, yeah. We have a remote. Uh, ah, okay, it's working. Uh, Kajtek Med from Slovenia. Uh, it's actually ENISA. Um, I'm sure you're aware of uh, this institution. Uh, you can find uh, there is a group, uh, Article 13A, which uh, deals with um, these problems. And you can also find on their webpage all um, cyber security strategies of all European Union countries. So I think this uh, organization also uh, comes and helps different countries uh, implement the st strategies. And so I, I think it's a good, um, good place to, to, to go to, or at least inform yourself uh, about it, about the topic. Sir? Yeah, sure. That is actually a very good point that you mentioned. However, uh, we have been having troubles cooperating with ENISA due to the fact that several countries in the region are not a part of European Union, nor haven't started yet the process of entering the European Union negotiations. For this reason, ENISA could not and will not and should not provide any support. Anything that they can do is publicly available on their website and so on. But coming to support like mutual support or training like they do for any other European countries. Unfortunately, they cannot do this for the region. Yeah, we have, we have been raising this for several times that this has to be somehow tackled and handled in different way. But unfortunately, due to the fact that they are European founded agencies, so there are no ways of changing the law for it. Still, only for these countries. So. Still, it stays that, of course, the, the resources over there on the NISA side are very, very useful. Okay, uh, we have one comment here and one last comment there, and then we are wrapping up. 
Okay, about the co cooperation about international re relations, I would like to thank, thank you, Francesca, for your comment about re re relation. It is a very impo important relation with um, uh, cyber divisions of UN, uh, EU, some Deloitte, maybe some Microsoft, but it is also very important uh, that the, the relation cooperation uh, at the place it is named first. It's a, uh, 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 for example, Georgia is a member of FIRST. It is a place where uh, you can, can share information about incident, about nature of incidents, about uh, organization, crime organization, organization of uh, who, who was attacker also. About, uh, this is very Im Im important also. Uh, about ENSA also, uh, Georgia Jan, Jan, Jan began and, uh, and implement standards of ENSA in our country also, and we are also cooperation with ENSA closely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so it's important to know, of course, the, the, this technical level of cooperation which really exists in, with INSERT, uh, FIRST, and, and uh, many others. Uh, the last comment in, in the back rows. Thank you. Uh, Sergio from Moldova. So uh, just I will try to cover all, uh, all in one. Uh, in Moldova, we have a program on uh, cybersecurity. Uh, it's similar to strategy. We, uh, the process was open, so uh, we uh, had all the state, uh, stakeholders involved. Uh, we used to, to have the um, international expertise, so the cases of uh, Estonia, Sweden, and uh, Republic of Korea. On the international cooperation, so there is uh, the International Telecommunication Union. It's a good platform for governments to uh, cooperate. Uh, they are uh, organizing cyber drills, and I would like to say within the EAP countries, so Eastern Partnership, there is a HDM panel, uh, Harmonization of Digital Markets panel, and uh, there is a uh, Trust and Secure Action Line, so uh, at least six, uh, six, uh, six uh, countries are uh, actively participating with the support of uh, European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing all the thoughts. Uh, we, we are definitely close to an end. Um, before listening to our wrap-up of the key messages uh, from the rapporteur, I wanted, uh, well, you all to get back to your phones uh, if you can. Uh, and we want to get a tweet from, well, hopefully each one of you, on your message from the panel today. So you can either tweet it, if you have a Twitter account, or you can Again, back to the platform and use it. Regard, disregard what, what says up lesson learned. Just tweet what you want to tweet. And in the meantime, we have the three <coughs> resource persons to tweet their own tweets. So, Gergana, you want to start? To say or to tweet it? Uh, <laughs> to say it. <laughs> All right. Um, but tweet. <laughs> All right, I'll tweet it afterwards. Um, I'd say cybersecurity issues are here to stay, and all stakeholders should work together to address them. Thank you. Francisca, you don't have the right to say retweet, so you have to, we have to hear your tweet. I retweet and then I add to it, because <laughs> I want to follow up. So uh, you're saying that all stakeholders should do something, and, and I think they should stop dragging their feet um, and, uh, and, and take responsibilities. Talking about governments, because you said earlier that I was talking. Um, I'm not talking on behalf of a government, by the way. I'm not working for the security sector or government, but from government's perspective, stop dragging your feet and uh, take uh, your responsibilities. Thank you. Major, you already tweeted it. Should I read it or should you? No, go, no, ahead. go ahead. So, all in all, what we have been discussing today and what we have been tackling, and unfortunately, I can just say one thing. There is no solution to cyber security. There is no solution. We might say cyber security is sexy, and it is sexy. However, there are many other sexier keywords that are very important here. And those are multi-stakeholder, multi-level, holistic, agile approach, and of course, in the end, someone already mentioned it, that creates a security culture. You know, you start sounding like a politician now, I can tell you. <laughs> okay, uh, back to the rapporteur uh, with the key messages. Thank you very much. Together with uh, Vladimir, we put up some notes uh, for you. I hope you will agree with, uh, with us again. 
so firstly, cybersecurity is quite a complex area of research. It goes, it goes firstly to vulnerabilities of an operating system who, even though it was known, the vulnerability I mean, um, not too many users uh, pay attention to it. Taking that, that into consideration, an advice would be to update the systems, well, antivirus and everything related to, uh, and yeah, well, the Unfortunately, I don't really understand my writing. Yeah, <laughs> users are mostly yeah users are mostly the weakest link, and according to a tweet that was a few minutes ago, ignorance seems to be our uh, new best friend. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Are you agree? Are you agree with with us on, on that? Uh, the second one is the software industry should be more responsible on their development. Uh, the human factor is very important. Uh, are you agree? Yes. Uh, the third one, the most important word that we're supposed to have in mind when we run for cybersecurity, as you can see it on the, on the screen, are education, awareness, and a good security strategy for each of us. Uh, is that, we, do you agree? Okay. Right. Cybersecurity laws are, adopt, uh, are adopted completely different, unfortunately, from one country to another. One of the solution might be, in the, uh, in the top top level discussion between different stakeholders, asking them to synchronize their the strategies among them and among the countries, uh, you know, in the in the in the um, region. And one more thing that is, well, I'm a rapporteur, so I might not be, uh, you know, uh, in the position to uh, add comments to. Uh, <laughs> To anything that, yeah, but, but I, will, I will take the, the opportunity. We debated a lot about uh, WannaCry, but if we are to compare WannaCry with Saxnet, with uh, the Flame, with Duku, I think WannaCry is just a, 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 a game for kids, if, if you are to, to compare with. Yeah, and that was my, 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 my comment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for misusing your, uh, your function, <laughs> but it was useful, definitely. So, uh, so uh, patch your system, back up your data, um, update your antivirus, don't click everywhere, don't share everything, and uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. Thank you for coming today, and uh, well, we are moving to the closing session. Big round of applause, applause for all of you. now at the end of CDIG and before I go into the conclusion I just need to test the WebEx one more time because we have two online participants. Johan, can you hear us? He did. Can you repeat please? I don't hear you. Yawan, can you hear us? We can't hear you. Okay. All right, so we are at the closing of um, CDIG and we have a tradition from our past meetings. What we do is um, asking our key supporting organization a few words and then we will get back to you and close the, um, the day. And we will start, sorry, <laughs> I'll try louder. Uh, we will start with Cengeta Masango from the Secretariat of the Internet Governance Forum, who was not able to join us in situ, but he will be speaking online. Cengeta, if you can hear us, we are listening to you. Cengeta? Well, it seems WebEx is making us trouble at the end of the day.
Okay, let's go ahead with the people we have in the room and we'll come back to Cengeta and Jovan a bit later. So who's the lucky winner? Among our supporting organizations, we still have in the room ICANN, the Internet Society, RIPE, Affilias. Can you join us somewhere in the front rows, please? Thank you, Andrea. Since you are the first, oh. <laughs> I'm supposed to talk too? Yes, by the way, I can. Everybody's exhausted. I can hear you. <laughs> OK. Well, we take, we take great pride in supporting CDIG. We have such a great bunch of people. So, is it working? Uh, it was a great, great pleasure being here, hearing all the discussions, being a part of the discussion. It was all very enjoyable, especially a big fan of the closing remarks. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you, Jiren, and uh, thank you to Frederica as well, although he's not here. Thanks so much for your support. Andrea? Okay, just a few words. So, um, I don't know where to start because for ICANN, uh, sponsoring CD is um, it's almost a given because it, it really goes into our commitment to getting people understanding what is internet governance, getting closer to its core processes, and, and for us getting them closer to ICANN. So it, for us it's an amazing entry, and plus it's, and I can tell from direct experience, it's, it's the, by far the most advanced, bottom-up, completely open, transparent, cross-national discussion about those issues that I've seen. And uh, you should be proud of it, uh, there is no other um, similar initiatives that is really, I was discussing with Serena yesterday on the bus coming back, it's not attached to a particular country, it's not attached to a particular institution, it's really attached to the community, and the community is, uh, doesn't know border, doesn't know, it's really the internet community in this case. So I'm, 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 I'm very happy to participate every year, and I'm, I'm very happy to see how it grows. I only have a request for you, is that uh, you, have, you should appreciate what you created, I think, a bit more, and, uh, and feel, feel, it, feel the ownership and make it grow even bigger and larger. So when you go back to your own country, uh, speak about CD with your community, with your, with your friends at work, even with your family, with your friends. It, you know, I don't mind if next, next CD we'll see, I'll see your grandmas coming. <laughs> Sure, they use the internet and they go on Skype, and you know they are, and they are as concerned as you are about those issues. So um, I, I would, I would really like to see more, uh, more of uptake from the community. We have, for the first time, we have the youth participating. I was amazed by the day that we spent together on the, uh, on the 24th, and um, and the city fellows. So those are all ideas that came through discussion with the executive committee in the community. Um, think about how you can contribute, how you can feel it even more closer to your needs and how you can serve the needs of your community. And I look forward to see you at the next CDIG edition and to get engaged as we move along. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you to Jean-Jacques, to Luna, to Bouquet, and everyone else from Aken who has helped us. And Sira Nushu is somewhere around. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's try again with our remote participants. Uh, Jovan, can you hear us? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. We fixed uh, technical problems. It is great to hear that you have uh, an excellent conclusion of the meeting and uh, congratulations for the uh, host uh, Macedonian uh, government and all colleagues who were involved in this process. Uh, I would like just to mention two points. The first one is the link between uh, Geneva and the CIDIC process. We had an event uh, co-organized with Macedonian permanent mission in uh, Geneva where we tried to link uh, dynamics in Geneva in the field of uh, digital commerce, data protection, 
human rights, uh, telecommunication infrastructure with the regional development. And I hope it helps uh, awareness building uh, uh, in, the, in the governments in the region about that. City can be plan to do more. We'll definitely brief them uh, uh, about the outcome of the, the, the city meeting. This is the first point. The second point is that uh, we as a region are close enough to the major technological centers and uh, to the places where technology is designed. But we are also far enough to keep some sort of uh, a spontaneity and creativity of the, of the region. And uh, I think that we should cherish that and we should find the space for creativity and innovation in this element of being close enough to the major technological center and being far enough uh, to have some sort of uh, space for innovation and creativity. That should be cherished throughout the region. A region has enormous potentials, many creative uh, people. History wasn't very, very gentle towards, uh, towards the region, but I think that we have a new chance, all countries, all people uh, in the region to develop something new in the digital field. And uh, I would like to invite you to continue with these efforts. You can count on Diplo support, uh, both in Geneva and through our office in, uh, in Belgrade. And once more, um, I would like to uh, congratulate all of those who are very involved in the organization of CIDI. I know that you put a long hours, but you also put a lot of emotions, uh, as it is a typical for our region. And what I can hear is that uh, uh, it paid off and you had a great event. Therefore, big, uh, big congratulations uh, from Geneva. Keep this way and you can count on uh, our support. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Jovan. And I know I should, shouldn't be doing this because I'm working for Diplo Foundation, but I need to thank my colleagues because they have been really, really helpful. So Vlada, Arvin, Daria, and everyone else in Belgrade, in Geneva, and in Malta, thanks a lot. And let us try with Cengetai as well. Cengetai, if you can hear us and you can speak. The sound is a bit low, so let us try to change it, or maybe you can increase the volume of your mic. Uh, increase the volume of my mic, so I can try. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. We're trying on our end as well. Okay, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you all um, for hosting the meeting. I am uh, very sorry that I wasn't able to join you. I did intend um, to be able to come to Macedonia, but um, unfortunately I couldn't due to the travel arrangements, etc. Um, I would also um, like to congratulate you the um, organizing committee, of course, Torina there, who has worked as a secretary as well. And I'd also like to um, congratulate, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the names. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Sasha, Diana, Aida, um, for the organization. And of course, Vlada, he was doing a very nice job there. Um, in the last session, um, moderating that session. Uh, this is the third CEDIC, and um, I think you know, CEDIC has been um, growing stronger and stronger with each passing year, and um, it's, it's done a very good job um, within the region uh, expressing the views of the CEDIC region. And I would also like to um, invite you all to also take part in the interstitial activities that we have here in um, Geneva at the IDF uh, meeting that we're going to be holding in, in this December. Um, the interstitial activities start now, and your voice is very important, and your unique perspective also on um, various internet governance issues is also very important. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time because everybody was rather short, so I'm going to be short as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much, and I will try my best to make it for the next exceeded meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Cengit. I will hold you on that. Um, I should have said at the beginning, the session, this was Cengetai Masango from the Secretariat of the Internet Governance Forum. For those of you who don't know who he is, though I guess 
those are very few. Thanks, thanks a lot, Chengetai. And I have one special thanks to Anya Gengo from the IGF Secretariat, who has been helping us a lot in putting sitting together. She wasn't able to join us, but she is online and she has been extremely helpful. So Anya, wherever you are, thanks so much. And we have a few other supporting organizations in the room, and I think I will start with RIPE. Yergana, Suzanne. Thanks. So I just want to say that it's a great pleasure for us to be here and also for RIPE to support uh, internet governance discussions in the region. Um, and uh, also wanted to very quickly remind you that we also host some regional events and our next one is just in a few weeks in Budva uh, on 12th and 13th of June. So if you're around, you're most welcome to join us. It's free. <laughs> so if you would like to continue some discussions, please welcome. <laughs> Thanks so much, and uh, one thank you also to Chris Buckridge, who hasn't uh, joined us this week, but he has been extremely supportive to CDIG as well. So thanks, Rive. Thanks, ladies, and thanks, Chris. Let's go through my list. Um, Desire, are you in the room? I'm looking in the room, but I don't see her. Mm. Okay, next on our list. I have, I guess I'm moving to our regional supporting organization. Bogdan? Surprise! <laughs> so I'm specialized in one word intervention. <laughs> so I'll just say thank you in Romanian. Mulțumesc. Mulțumim și noi, Bogdan. Thank you. Uh, one word platform, we have a few ladies around who would like to say a few words. Thank you. I know you didn't have me enough, but my wonderful friends and colleagues didn't want to show up, so that's what you get. Thank you very much, everyone. Macedonia and all the CDQ. Thank you. Thanks also. And because I am next to Wolf, you already Wolf, few words. Well, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for having been invited again. It was a huge pleasure to come and attend the third CEDIC, which was, as you all realized, a plain success. Thanks to the host and congrats to the XCOM. You once again did just a great job. Please keep in mind the end of CEDIC is the beginning of a next step. And one of the next step for those of you who are next Tuesday in Switzerland in Bern, you will be invited to a Swiss IGF, which is a small, cozy thing. But there is a next big challenge, what is Eurodic, a week later in Tallinn in Estonia. And I guess I may see a lot of you in Tallinn again. And it will be a special pleasure besides the event itself, to have the 10th anniversary of Eurodic, what we will celebrate accordingly in Tallinn. So, that's it. The process goes on and the dialogue goes on. And thanks to all of you. 
thank you also both. Thank you to Eurovig and to Sandra, who is not with us, but also has been extremely supportive. I need to mention a few other organizations. Although they are not here, they have been helping Tidi Galak. We have the IGF Support Association. Marcus Kumar has spoken um, to us. I think he did that yesterday. Um, Afilias Desiree should have been somewhere around, but she has been helpful as well. The um, Serbian CCTLD Registry, the Council of Europe, European Commission, Internet Society Armenia, and Internet Society um, Belgrade. So thank you to everyone for supporting CDG over these past two years. And now we have a bit of a, well, new thing at the closing session of CDG. As you have been told, we had this year two new programs, the Youth School and the Fellowship Program. And Andrea, if we can start with the Youth School, some um, surprises for our students, some diplomas acknowledging their participation in the program. So, Andrea, I give the floor. Yeah. Yeah. So, where are the students? Stand up. Don't be shy. A big applause to the students because I, I think they have been, they have been amazing. They are the future of city. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to have them. So how does it work? Shall I just? So, Wada Mema, please. Shall we take a picture? What is there? Ah, of course. There. With the flowers. Thank you. Adriana Gavrilovic. Where is Adriana? Uh, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, the flower. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, picture, picture. Ani Mukherjee. Yeah, enough flowers. Anna Romandas. Anna Romandas. She's coming. Very safe. No flowers for Anna. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. This is your diploma. Thank you. Avec <laughs> Drakian. Next is Corina Cicea. Cicea. Diana Mulaj. Gezara Alili.
Lenyo Mareka. No, she's not here, so we will give the diploma to, to her colleagues. Loretta Cross. Oh, she's here. Sabayete Elezai. Sasso Naidov. Teodora Kish. Tina Lukasic. Vlado Velichovsky, is he here? We will give it. So, thank you again. This is the first time that we have the Institute School. I'm sure that will not be, it's not the last one. I'm sure that I will see you in other internet governance events. I will see you around. Physically, it will be online. But uh, it's just, as we said yesterday, it's just the first step of a, of a long, no, the day before yesterday. It's our first step of a long journey and you will see that uh, you can contribute and we need you as much as you as we can. Thank you. Don't leave us, we'll have group photo with all certificates. Without flowers. More photos. Thank you, Andrea, thank you, Silanus, and many thanks to ICANN once again for uh, supporting this program. And the second program we had is the fellowship program and I will ask Jaren to go into the same process. Thanks so much. With the yellow flowers? With the yellow. I'll skip the flowers. Yes, so, Olga Kirilyuk, please come here. Congratulations. Susonia Herring. Vladimir Svanadze. <laughs> Ucha Seturi. Nenad Marinkovic.
Marie Blagojewicz. Kubashvili. Domen Savic. Kostam. Katalin Vrabi. Velma Kuchukalic. Anessa Agovic. <laughs> Andrea Maria Tirziu. I'm sorry for if I uh, announced it wrongly. Yeah. Oh, nice. Andra Bukur. <laughs> and Andrea Russo. Just yet, we'll have group photos with the. Yes, yes, there will be photos with all the groups, but we have a few more announcements to make. And thank you, uh, thank you, Jeren, thank you to Frederic. Please pass our thanks to him. Uh, and on behalf of the executive committee of CDIC, and I guess of the whole CD community, congrats to the fellows and the youth for going through this program and being here with us. And you are now official part of the community, so you won't go away. <laughs> thanks, guys. We have another surprise. We announced at the fellowship and the youth uh, sessions that those that tweet most will get some prizes. And let us announce the winners. Sonia will do that. But first, let me thank Sonia. Very last minute, she jumped in to help with CTIC social media. Sonia, thanks a lot for doing that over it was these my past pleasure. days. It was my pleasure. Um, so, just one second. I want to get the name right. Uh, the person who received the most interaction on their tweets on CDIG, who is also a fellow, is the internet <laughs> Maria, but is, uh, per the last name I'm looking at the phone. And, uh, yes, yes, Maria. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Maria. And that was the Twitter part. Uh, Desiree has just joined us. So, Desiree, a few words as a supporting organization for CIDIC. Uh, 
And thank you. I think it shows us it's a worthwhile uh, thing to support. So just on behalf of Affiliates, which is the organization I, I work for, um, an Irish American uh, UK <laughs> registry for .info.mobi. Um, we, um, you know, love to support talents and uh, you obviously won. Thanks so much, Desire, to both Afigas and Dice of Serbia for supporting CD. <laughs> Thank you for all the heads. Um, okay, so we will go to the actual final thank you. But before that, one last announcement. We are very, very happy to learn that the Macedonian Internet Governance Forum is about to be launched soon. So congrats for that to everyone who's been working on this. And we hope this will inspire other national IGF initiatives to do the same. So for anything CD can help, let us know. And now I have to do the final thank you part for everyone who's been helping with CD, in addition to those that have been already mentioned. So let me start. This will be long. For the um, Agency for Electronic Communications, I will just say very few names, but the whole team has been amazing, so thanks for that. Um, Alexander, I'm not sure if he's around, but thank you for all the technical support. Some round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, Elisabetta, I'm not sure if she's around, but many thanks to her as well, and to Dragica as well, and I'm sure I messed up her name, but I'm sorry. Um, thank you to Marnet and especially Sanya, if she's around, if not, anyway, she deserves a round of applause. We have another program at CDIG this year, the internship program. Merve, Powell, just so people see you. Merve and Paul have joined us really, really last minute, but they have been helping a lot over the past few months, so they deserve this. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. And I hope you have enjoyed working for CDIG. Thank you to all those who have, have helped contributing to the sessions, to the focal points. If I read you one by one, we will never end, but thanks so much for everything. Thank you to those who have helped with the CDIG Youth School. Andrea, um, Michael, Anya online, and everyone else, many thanks for that. And well, thank you to you, the community, for being here with us, for contributing to our activities, for putting this program together because it hasn't been us, the executive committee. And last but not least, thank you to Liana, to Sasho, to Aida, and to Dushan, although he has resigned, he has helped us a lot. And to Sorina.